morning. Good morning. And a warm welcome to Newcomen up Parish Church. Is it on? It's red. Okay. You bring it closer. Andy and Caroline are in holiday today, so we've got an apprentice this morning. <laughs> we'll start again. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> and welcome to those who will join us later, also online and on the phone. If you need pastoral cover, please do contact the Reverend Ken York on 01292 670 476 or 07762-835-269. The service today will be available on the phone and online on Monday evening this week from 7pm. The prayer time continues this Wednesday evening from 6.45 to 7.30pm. The flowers this morning have been gifted by Mrs Nan Patterson. The tea and coffee is once again available after the service and you're invited to share fellowship there. There will be an events committee meeting tomorrow morning, that's Monday the 6th of August at 11am, 1st of August at 11am in the session room. There will be a meeting of the coffee bean helpers on Thursday the 11th of August at 10am in the big hall. Next Sunday morning, that's Sunday the 7th of August, the CIRT session will meet after morning worship. This is regarding information from presbytery. Any intimations you may have should be given to myself no later than Thursday evening. COVID sense guidelines are still in place. It's your choice if you wear a face covering or not in church. Hand sanitizer is available as you come in and as you leave and offerings will be made in entry. And please do respect other people's personal space, as COVID is still with us. The worship team would like to extend their thanks to everyone who prayed and supported them over the last few weeks. This morning, we welcome back the Reverend Ken York from his holidays. And I am, for one, I'm glad to see him here this morning. Thank you, Morag. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> It is very nice to be back with you here in Newcomnock. Although through the, the wonders of technology, I was able to listen to the service here uh, on the last four weeks, with Muriel Wilson on the first Sunday and then the worship team. And I was very proud of the worship team and the, the efforts that they made in conducting worship. So it was good to see so although I was a thousand miles away, I was still able to worship God with you, albeit in the afternoon, but with you uh, here in Newcomer. And when I was on holiday, I've been reading a book written by uh, a, a man who was one of my lecturers in Glasgow University, John Ziziulis who is now an archbishop in the Greek Orthodox Church. And he was bringing to the minds of his readers the truth that the church of Jesus Christ, which we call the body of Christ, is worldwide. We tend to narrow the church down to New Cumnock, to the Presbytery of Ayr, to the Church of Scotland, to the church in the United Kingdom, when in fact we are part of something very much bigger than that. We are part of the body of Christ in the world, which contains many denominations. It contains people who worship in different ways, but people who worship God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's good for us to remember that and not to restrict God in a sense by believing that the church is only here where we are. The church is worldwide. Thanks be to God. Let us now worship God.
We now stand to sing to God's praise our first hymn. Praise the Lord, you heavens adore him. The heavens tell out the glory of God. The vault of heaven reveals his handiwork. Let us pray. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, we gather here today people of many families, and we come remembering different experiences. Yet we all come as one people, for we are all your people. In our moments of deepest concentration, we have known you working with us. In our moments of relaxation, we have been caught up into your eternal peace. In our moments of exhilarating delight, we have heard you laughing with us in our joy. And in our moments of dread and despair, we have heard you weeping with us in our grief. In the moment of bewilderment and confusion, we have felt the steady heartbeat of creation. In the moment of discovery, we have glimpsed the frontiers of your truth. In everything that matters, you have been beside us, not blinding us with the majesty of your glory, but allowing us to glimpse the wonder of your reality. And even when we have not recognized your presence, still it is only your love that has held us in being. And so, Heavenly Father, what else can we do today but open our hearts to you in song? Accept our praises, for we are filled with wonder at your glory and your love. Merciful Father, we know that we are not the people that you really want us to be. We are not even the people that we long to be ourselves. Sometimes we reach out for the new life you offer us, but too often we are content with second best. Sometimes we glimpse eternal joy, but too often we are content with passing pleasures. Sometimes we allow ourselves to share our neighbor's agony, but too often we are content to offer cheap sympathy. Father, this is our life, and we are not always satisfied with it because we long for it to be better. 
We know that you will accept us as we confess our failure. And we present ourselves now in the knowledge of our foolishness, our half-heartedness, and our unnecessary fears. Father, we thank you that you forgive us. You forgive us for being what we are. We thank you that you accept us, half-hearted as we are. And we thank you that you recommission us, timid as we are. Make us now your people, unburdened by the past, unfearful of the future, and joyful in the eternal presence. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. And hear us now as we pray together in his words, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now listen for a moment to the Word of God. The first reading this morning is from Romans chapter 1, verses 8 to 17. Paul's longing to visit Rome. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts to make you strong. That is, that you and I may mutually encourage by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am bound both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Next reading is John chapter 3, verses 31 to 36. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Thanks be to God for his word to us today. Now we're going to say our prayers for others. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather here, a community of your people, we come now to remember the needs of others. Although we today enjoy our day of rest, there are people for whom it is like other days. People who must work on Sundays if our life is to continue as usual. People whose responsibilities are always with them. 
We pray that even in the midst of their activity and their concern, they may know the light of your truth. We remember those who today enjoy a break from daily work, but who must start tomorrow a new week's work. Lord, inspire all the daily life of men and women so that we may live together in that community of concern and love that you intend for us and work together for the coming of your kingdom. Lord, we remember that all over the world today, Christian people are joining together to celebrate your glory. And so we pray that the church in every land may carry that celebration into everyday living, rejoicing to tell the world of your love and to minister to human need in Jesus' name. Lord, we remember that all over the world today, the nations and their rulers remember their past, contemplate their present, and make plans for the future. We pray that a vision of your truth and your glory may more and more inspire the hearts and the minds of men and women that their rulers may seek only to serve and the people may live in peace. Lord, we remember that all over the world today there are people who are suffering, suffering from illness and pain, from hunger and poverty, from loneliness and fear, from bereavement and sorrow, for violence, amongst violence and amongst aggression. Lord, we pray for an end to all their suffering, that they may be comforted by the knowledge of your love, that we may be used to help them wherever possible. And in the moment of quietness now, Lord, we remember people known to us who are going through a time of great need. Into your hands, Lord God, we commend ourselves and all the men and women and children of the world. May your will be done always and everywhere. Amen. We now stand to sing, Sing to God, New Songs of Worship.
Well, as some of you know, I have been on a journey. The place that my wife and I visit in France is around about 1,000 miles away from our home. And we do that journey by road and, of course, by ship crossing the, the English Channel. I want to talk today about someone else who went on a journey. Not quite as far as mine, just over 600 miles. But it was a journey from Corinth to Rome. About 25 years after the crucifixion, on a bright spring morning, two people walked the long street from the city center of Corinth down to a little harbor. And what happened at the quayside on that morning probably seemed quite common to any onlookers who were there. But that incident is now full of interest to those who understand what was happening. Beside one of the wharfs, a ship is lying, just on the point of sailing for Italy. And the sailors are rushing about in obedience to the orders of the captain, while the passengers are saying their farewells to their relatives and friends on the quayside. Of the various groups of people that are gathered there, our interest centers itself on two people who have come down that long road together. And one is a middle-aged woman, evidently one of the passengers. And beside her is a man. He is a small and insignificant in appearance man. But he has a face with personality on it. Personality that shows him to be no ordinary person. This man, as he says goodbye to the woman, draws from under his arm a bulky roll of manuscript, which he gives to her with careful instructions about how and to whom it is to be delivered. Last farewells are said. Sails are hoisted, and slowly the vessel glides out on its way across the Gulf of Corinth. I cannot tell you the name of that ship, nor do I know what kind of general cargo it was carrying. But I can say this, that ship that morning had great treasure on board. For that little man on the quay was Paul, the great apostle of the Gentiles. And the woman to whom he spoke was Phoebe, his sister in the Lord. And while that roll of manuscript which Paul gave her was his letter, written at Corinth to the church at Rome, a letter which Renong, the French author, declared carried the whole future of Christian theology, be that as it may, it was certainly a letter which Paul believed contained the message of the gospel. And his reason for sending it to the church at Rome was because that little church there had been founded by other Christians, not by Paul himself. And he was anxious that it should maintain its life and its existence, even amid the imperial supremacy of that most important city of Rome. He writes to say that he hopes soon to be able to visit them, that he, he may encourage them and establish them in their Christian faith. And he declares quite clearly, 
that he is not ashamed to come among them and declare God's power. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the saving power of God for everyone who has faith. Now we might think that the gospels are indeed the highlight of the Bible. So we might ask the question, why would Paul think that he might be ashamed of the gospel? Well, we can be sure that had Paul not been the committed and dedicated man that he was, he might easily have become ashamed of the gospel. Just as we can be as certain that many so-called Christians then were actually ashamed of the gospel when they were put under pressure. But why should they be ashamed of it? Well, just because the word gospel, when written alongside the word Rome, seemed so insignificant. You see, what impressed people at the time Paul lived was the sheer grandeur of the Roman Empire. The very name Rome was the symbol of magnificence and power, for Rome was the seat of this great Roman Empire. The city which had conquered and ruled the world. Here was the very center of society, the wealthy, the noble, the distinguished, all met within her palaces and her mansions. So is it to be wondered that the simple gospel, when placed alongside all the pomp that Rome could boast, seemed poor and insignificant? It needed one with Paul's insight to see that in the gospel simplicity lay its great strength. Within it was the great truth that people cannot live by bread alone. He could see that all the pomp and the glory and the show of Rome would pass, but the gospel would remain constant because it met a deep-seated need of the human heart. And has this not proved itself to be true? The word of God which Paul preached is still alive today. But where is the word of Nero? Paul's gospel is as much as ever the power of God today. Where is the power of ancient Rome? Buried in the dust, of countless ages. The obscure missionary who was led on foot through the Appian Gate among the throng of prisoners bound to a soldier of Nero's army has proved to be the mightier of the two. And who shall say today at Rome that Paul had any cause to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ? If the cause of truth, if the word of God is to be carried to victory, it will be done by people like Paul. People like Paul today who are not ashamed of the gospel. People who are not afraid for, to let other people know that they are Christians. The evening before my wife and I sailed, from Dieppe, we went with two friends into a restaurant for a meal. And the restaurant was packed with people. It was very busy. <clears throat> and sitting next to us were four people who were speaking in English. And my wife had worked out that she thought that perhaps the, the three ladies were nuns in plain clothes. And the gentleman was a priest, certainly from the talk that they had that seemed quite likely. And when their meal came, in the middle of this busy restaurant, they each bowed their heads, 
forward together at the table. And some people around were looking askance at them. But they were clearly praying. Thanking God, perhaps, for their day. Thanking God for the food they were about to receive. And then they lifted their heads and went on with the meal. On the ferry, on the way home, three ladies came in and sat beside us in a reasonably busy corner of the dining room on the boat. They were the three ladies that we had seen the night before. Again, when their food came, they bowed their heads over their meal. Again, I suspect, thanking God for the food they were about to receive. Amidst all others around them, they were not ashamed of the gospel. They were not ashamed to let people know, even in that very quiet way, that they were Christians. Many, many years ago, I read a book written by an English canon who had been a missionary in South Africa. And one Sunday he preached on this text, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And walking home after the service in the company of the man with whom he was staying, a, 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 a conversation was started. The host, who was the manager of a big gold mine there, said to the, 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 the English canon, you made me feel ashamed of myself tonight. Then he told his story. He had been in a wild part of the country, 40 miles north of Johannesburg, and staying for a night at a horrible Dutch inn. He had been ashamed to have a room, to share a room with two strange looking miners in very rough clothes. They were carrying pistols and knives. And when it was time to go to bed, he was afraid to carry out his usual custom of kneeling down to pray in case his roommates would, would mock him. So he went outside <coughs> and he knelt down and he prayed. <coughs> and when he came back into the room, the two rough-looking miners were kneeling by their own beds in prayer. It turned out that they were deeply religious men from Cornwall. And then the host said to Canon Green, I felt such a, a, a sneak that I vowed I would always say my prayers wherever I was as long as I lived. And a few days later, he was traveling south from Johannesburg and he shared a sleeping compartment with three members of the traveling post office. These men were used to traveling from Johannesburg to Cape Town, spending two days and nights on the train every week in order to meet the incoming mail. And on the return journey, they sorted the letters. The first night of this particular train journey, these men were playing cards when the minister wanted to sleep. He wondered if he should kneel down and pray. Perhaps he would just pray in bed. <clears throat> Then he remembered the story of the Cornish miners. Yes, he must kneel down and pray. Next morning after breakfast, one of the men came to him and said, You made me feel ashamed of myself last night. I was once a choir boy in St. Albans Church in Holborn, and I said prayers for years. Last night, when the others were asleep, I got out of my bunk and I prayed for the first time in years. The minister was glad, and he told the man to pray that night when his friends were awake. The man said he would. The minister never knew where that man kept his word, but if he did, then perhaps he made others feel ashamed, and the power of example kept on doing its good work. But let's go back to the question. Why is Paul not ashamed of the gospel? The answer is 
because with all its seeming weakness, the gospel is power. <clears throat> it's power with a very definite end. It is the saving power of God for everyone who has faith. The Christian message is a powerful message. The gift it offers us is a gift of power. And the gospel of Jesus is a gospel for this present time, just because to people who are oppressed by forces they can't escape, by passions they can't themselves subdue, by mysteries they cannot solve, it opens out an inexhaustible supply of life, of strength, of energy, of confidence, and of power. Paul was convinced of the saving power of Christ. And there are thousands of people today who are far from realizing the truth of this. Perhaps it isn't considered to be the in thing to be a Christian today. <clears throat> but that is nothing new. It was so in Paul's day. But despite the popular trend in Paul's day, he was not induced to be ashamed of the gospel. Nor should we today. Don't ever be ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Can you say, Quite right, Paul. Neither am I. Thanks be to God for his word to us today. And to his name be glory and praise. Amen. Now we sing, we sing a love that sets all people free. <clears throat>
Let us pray. Lord our God, you have surrounded us with so many gifts of your love, and we remember them now, and we thank you, for you are the giver. You have given us the gift of life itself, and so for the years that are past, we thank you. For the years that are to come, we trust you, and for all the joys and opportunities of this present time, we bless you. Lord, you have given us the gift of love for our families and our friends and for all the human relationships that enrich our lives, we praise you. You have given us the gift of power to control and use the physical world about us. The good fruits of science and technology are your gifts for our enjoyment. And you have given each one of us some special gift, some special cause for thankfulness which lifts our hearts in gratitude when we remember it. <clears throat> for you have given us Jesus, and through him you have offered us life indeed, and love and power for this world and for the world to come. For this, your greatest gift, we thank you from the fullness of our hearts. And now, Lord, as we present these offerings <clears throat> upon this table, we pray that our minds may reflect the mind of Jesus, that our bodies may be fit dwellings for your Holy Spirit, and that our whole life may be an offering that brings you joy and honor for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> our closing hymn is Christ is our light. May God give to you and all whom you love his comfort and his peace, his light and his joy in this world and the next. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen.